Hello, my name is Daryl Worthy, and you're watching another episode of Unworthy History. We call it Unworthy History because here on this channel we talk about actual history, unlike the History Channel that just talks about aliens and pawning old used goods and stuff like that. Uh, so lately uh, I've been doing a number of shows countering revisionist uh, Texas history. There was a very slanderous and defaming book uh, put out by some journalists uh, last summer called Forget the Alamo. Uh, and I think we should forget about this book, but unfortunately uh, a lot of people seem to have taken a liking to it and they believe the nonsense that uh, they tell in there. So basically the book makes out uh, Santa Ana as this wonderful person uh, and it disparages the uh, the causes of the Texas Revolution. It says the only reason for the revolution of Texas in 1836 was because they wanted to uh, preserve slavery. Uh, and so I've uh, done many shows uh, kind of countering that revisionist narrative. And this is another one. So on this one, uh, I'm going to read from this book. I've read uh, some from this book before. So this was Hender Henderson K. Yoakum's. History of Texas. This is volume one. Uh, he wrote this. It was published about uh, 1855, so it was one of the earliest histories uh, of Texas after uh, the formation of the Republic and then the, um, when it became a state. And so today I'm going to read part of this uh, great history book, volume one again. Uh, I'm going to be reading on page 142 if you'd like to follow along at home. Uh, and so I'm going to read about um, when the Texans first had to come up with their state constitution, what they put in that. Uh, and then I'm also, it's also going to cover the rise of Santa Ana uh, back in 1833. So all of this is uh, telling a little bit about the, uh, the history of Texas in 1833. Uh, and it's going to shed some light on maybe why, uh, why some of their grievances with the Mexican government started at this time. <clears throat> According to the Federal Constitution, that's of Mexico, of 1824, the legislatures of the several Mexican states were required on the first day of September, 1832, to vote for a president and vice president of the republic. This, it appears, they did not do until the 29th of March, 1833. Santa Ana was elected president without opposition. He took his seat on the 16th of May following. The most popular man, with the exception of the viceroy, Jose Galvez, that had occupied the National Palace. A hero of the Revolution of 1821, the conqueror of the tyrant Iturbide, the friend of Victoria, the victor over Baradas in 1829, and the supposed unyielding friend of the Republican Constitution of 1824. He declared in his inaugural address that it had been the object of his life to secure them to Mexicans the full enjoyment of their rights, and to break the triple yoke of ignorance, tyranny, and vice, that he would attend to the interests of education, and that his administration, like his own character, should be mild and tolerant. Such were the, his professions, and such happy auspices under which he assumed the reins of power. In making these professions, he seemed to have exhibited his contempt for the Mexican people, for he seized the first occasion to give the lie to all he had said. In the meantime, on the 1st of March, 1833, the people of Texas had renewed their election of delegates to the postponed convention to frame a constitution. The Mexicans did not participate in this election because it had not been ordered by the political chiefs. The delegates assembled on the 1st April following at San Felipe. A body of more distinguished men had not met in Texas. Among them were Branch T. Archer, Stephen F. Austin, David G. Burnett, Sam Houston, one of the five delegates from Nacogdoches, J.B. Miller, and William H. Wharton. The latter was chosen president of the convention. The members entered upon their labors in earnest. The requisite committees were appointed. Among them were the important committee, uh, committees on the Constitution and on a memorial to the Supreme Government of Mexico. Sam Houston was appointed chairman to the first, so the state constitution, and David G. Burnett of, of the second named committee. The Constitution was framed as a model of republicanism, with now and then an indication, however, that some clauses were inserted and some principles retained to, uh, to please the Mexican ear. The right of trial by jury, the writ of habeas corpus, 
the right of petition, freedom of the press, direct and universal suffrage, and all those clauses usual in a Bill of Rights were inserted. On the subject of religious liberty, however, they were silent. So they did that to appease uh, the Mexican authorities because Catholicism was the state religion. A considerable debate was had on the subject of the banking clause. B.T. Archer was in favor of, and Sam Houston opposed, opposed to allowing them. The latter prevailed, and it was declared by the convention that no bank or banking institution or office of discount and deposit or any other moneyed corporation or banking establishment should ever exist under the, that constitution. The convention completed its labors and, ad and adjourned on the 13th of April. The memorial... Uh, the memorial to the Supreme Government was drawn up by David G. Burnett. It is an excellent document and delimitates with forcible elegance and correctness the unhappy position of Texas. There were other matters claiming the attention of the convention. <coughs> Unprincipled men, for the sake of gain, had been engaged in the piratical practice of incorporating black slaves from Africa into Texas. And though some of them had been arrested and hung by the British cruisers, the business still continued. Strong resolutions were offered and passed prohibiting this traffic. So if you didn't catch that, uh, this was in the state, uh, the state constitution uh, convention back in 1833, and they actually prohibited the African slave trade. Uh, the British, uh, British government had already prohibited the slave trade in its colonies, and it had spent extensive resources as well as uh, even human lives uh, in preventing the further uh, slave trade or the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, so that's something that I think really goes against the narrative of the revisionist uh, historians of Forget the Alamo. <clears throat> it was necessary to select delegates to present to the Supreme Government the wants and wishes of the people of Texas. Stephen F. Austin, William H. Wharton, and J.B. Miller were chosen for that purpose, the former by the largest vote. They were instructed to present to the central government not only the application for a separate state organization, but also for the repeal of the odious decree of April 6, 1830, prohibiting natives of the United States from emigrating to Texas. Also the enactment of a law establishing regular mails in Texas, the defense of the colonies against the Indians, and the regulation of the tariff. For various causes, Austin was the only, was the only one of the commissioners that went to Mexico. He set out shortly after the adjournment of the convention and reached the capital in time to see it in a scene of confusion and intrigue. As his stay in Mexico was lengthy and greatly prolonged by political events, it will be proper to refer to them in this place. On the 1st of June next, following the installation of Santa Ana, General Dur Duran pronounced in favor of the church and the army, that is, a strong central government, at the same time nominating Santa Ana as a dictator. It has been suggested that Santa Ana was at the bottom of this movement, though without any other evidence than that of his subsequent conduct. He sent out a strong force under the command of Arista for its suppression. So Santa Ana at this time was trying to put down a centralized military dictatorship, which of course he would later um, assume the, the, the role of dictator in. On the march, Arista himself declared for the plan of Duran. So Arista uh, declared for the centralized dictatorship. This declaration was echoed back from the army in the city, but Gomez Farias, a civilian and an honest supporter of the Constitution of 1824, the vice president acting as president in the absence of Santa Ana, suspecting that the latter had some hand in this matter, proceeded with the aid of Lorenzo de Zavala, then governor of Mexico, to raise a force of Republicans and in a short time put down this attempt upon the Constitution. Santa Ana appears to have remained a willing captive in the hands of Arista. It was only when he found that the movement was abortive that he pretended to escape from his captors and return to the capital. Arista was pardoned and Duran banished. This little farce is an epitome of the life of Santa Ana. Upon these new laurels, Santa Ana retired to his estates, leaving the government in the hands of Farias and a Republican Congress. The country was deeply in debt. The revenues were exhausted. The active means and resources of the nation had fallen into the possession of the clergy. 
To lighten the public burden, the army was reduced, and to raise further means to meet the public wants, a part of the revenues of the church were appropriated. These admirable decrees of the Congress were duly approved by Farias. The church was thereupon aroused, and uniting with those opposed to the federal form of government, poured in their petitions for the appeal of these laws. The repeal of these laws. Santa Anna, while in his retirement, meditating on his ambitious projects, had determined in his mind to abandon the Republican Party, overturn the Constitution of 1824 and establish an absolute centralized government. His instruments to be used for the accomplishment of these ends were the church and the army, acting at once on the superstitions and fears of the people. Hence he gave countenance and encouragement to these petitions and openly expressed his dislike for Farias and his administration. While Santa Anna was thus fanning the flame of civil war, in which he expected to reap the principal harvest, Austin, the faithful representative of Texas, was endeavoring in vain to obtain the action of the government upon the matters by him laid before it. His petitions were referred to a committee of Congress where they, were, where they slept. While a revolutionary contest was raging in many parts of the Republic, and especially about the Capitol, to add to the confusion, the cholera broke out with great virulence and in a few weeks carried off 10,000 of the inhabitants in the metropolis alone. The epidemic, had, the epidemic had deranged the meetings of Congress, and so desponding were the hopes of Austin that in his letter of October 2nd, 1833, to the municipality of Bejar, so that is back in uh, San Antonio, he recommended that all the municipalities of Texas should unite in organizing a state under the provisions of the Acta Constitutiva of May, 2nd, May 7th, 1824, and by union and harmony prepare for a refusal of their application by the supreme government. He further advised them that if they did not take matters into their own hands, Texas was ruined forever. While this letter was on its way, Austin succeeded in... Uh, procuring the repeal of the law of April 6, 1830, prohibiting the natives of the United States from immigrating hither as colonists, and set out for home on the 10th of December, 1833. But his letter of the 2nd of October was transmitted by the municipality of Behar to Vice President Farias, who, finding in it what he believed to be treasonable matter, dispatched an express for Austin, had him arrested at Saltillo, and taken back to Mexico and imprisoned. Farias, though in principle a Republican, was not accustomed to the freedom of speech natural to the Texans. In the October previous, Austin had told him very plainly that the Texans had determined, if the federal government did not remedy the evils which threatened them, to remedy them themselves without waiting any longer on the ground that self-preservation rendered such a step necessary and would justify it. Farias construed the, this into a threat and personal insult, and though he had become partially reconciled to Austin, before he departed on the 10th of December, the letter to the Corporation of Behar renewed and increased his exasperation. Austin was shut up in prison on the 13th of February, 1824, where he remained in close confinement for three months, excluded from the use of books or writing materials, or even the light of day. Uh, so I'm going to end it there uh, for this episode, but I think this is very uh, informative, and I doubt a lot of this information is included in the slanderous and uh, fiction, fictitious book, uh, um, Forget the Alamo, uh, that uh, you should avoid at all costs. Or if you do read that, then be sure to educate yourself on other Texas history, because uh, that is revisionist Texas history that isn't accurate at all and just conforms to a narrative that is very popular right now. Uh, so in this, we saw that uh, the uh, Constitution of Texas met, uh, and the only uh, time they discussed slavery in that uh, uh, first state constitution convention was to ban the um, transatlantic slave trade. Um, so if they, you know, really were um, really enjoyed, you know, slavery so much, the leaders of the, the Texas Revolution, why did they ban the African slave trade? Uh, in 1833. That doesn't make a lot of sense. It doesn't fit uh, with the narrative of people who wrote uh, Forget the Alamo. Uh, then we also saw, this is the beginning of Santa Ana, uh, turning from his support for uh, republicanism and the Constitution of 1824 that was modeled a lot after the American uh, Constitution. Uh, we can see him start to turn from that and support the church and the army uh, and, and their establishment of a centralized dictatorship. So I uh, hope you enjoyed this episode. Uh, my first Countering Revisionist History um, video that I did a few months ago 
Uh, it's been fairly popular. I think it has uh, about almost a thousand views. Uh, that's popular for my channel at least right now. Uh, but it has uh, 18 likes and 25 dislikes. So it's very discouraging that so many people uh, buy into this revisionist uh, narrative. So if you like this uh, video, then be sure to like and subscribe. And you might think about going to my Countering Revisionist, uh, revisionist Texas History video and liking that to counter some of the uh, haters out there of Texas. Um, so anyhow, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Unworthy History.